right now. Yep. Okay. So <laughs> we are live and we're waiting for a few people to tune in and then we can start. Maybe we can. Nope. <laughs> So that is ready. Ah, aspetta che faccio una foto. Do good live in the chat. Hello, everybody who's tuning in. Uh, we will be starting in a couple of minutes. We're waiting for a few people to, to arrive. Whenever you want, Tommy, I think we can start. Yeah, no? give it give it another second. <laughs> We can leave this. You see the other participants, or yeah, yeah, yeah. I see the participants coming in. Uh, they're tuning in right now, so maybe just give it another minute because I see the number rising. So, and after that, we can start. Is it fine? Okay, so I think we can begin and then people will tune in. Um, so welcome everybody. We're here with the second episode of our Biodiversity Talks, uh, an event in the Kut Dialogues. Uh, as always, uh, we would like to thank you, to thank our host and to thank you for tuning in. Uh, Cecilia will introduce our, our guest uh, pretty soon. Uh, first, before we start a few um, housekeeping rules. So if you have any question, as happened last time, just type them in the box and we will collect them and ask them during the interview or at the end of the interview. Uh, this meeting will be recorded and then it will be uploaded to our channels. So you can watch later or share it. And being said that, thank you for being here. And Cecilia, if you'd like to introduce him. Yeah. Then good afternoon, everybody, again, and uh, thank you very much, Professor Ray Clements, to be here with us. And um, after a, a quick introduction of our guests, we will then dive into our questions. And so Ray Clements is a professor at Wageningen University and studies econ ecosystem, uh, biodiversity, ecosystem services, environmental change, vulnerability, and sustainability. I personally had the chance to have him as a professor in a course that introduced me to the topic of climate change in the global context, and that was really eye-opening for me. Uh, with, this with his academic uh, experience, he contributed to the most important international uh, science policy assessment, such as the International Panel on Climate Change. For those who don't know, um, is uh, the IPCC provides policymakers with scientific knowledge on climate change, its implications, and potential risks in the future. 
Um, Rick also contributed with uh, UNEP uh, at the Global Environmental Outlook at the Millennial Ecosystem Assessment. Also, um, he, is, he uh, represented the International Council for Science uh, in the, in, at the latest development at the UNF, F, UNF uh, CCC uh, between 2011 and 2016. And last but not least, uh, he is also the founding editor for scientific journal, journal Current Opinion of Environmental Sustainability and leads research pro projects worldwide. And uh, he's especially, uh, he's especially uh, interested in inspire, uh, inspiring young scientists. So thank you again. If you want to add anything, uh, feel free. <laughs> but otherwise we can just um, dive into the first question. So within the environmental debate, climate change has been predominant in the past years. And while biodiversity loss has been all, almost overlooked. However, these two crises are deeply interlinked and we cannot talk about biodiversity and not talk about climate change. So recently, recently, an interesting article was published on Nature, the uh, web, uh, the website, uh, regarding the pace of biodiversity loss in warming climate, and we ask ourselves: We will see a number of loss in biodiversity worldwide, world, worldwide, or will it be all spreaded over time? And therefore, we want to uh, know your opinion on the issue and. Uh, also, if we are, uh, if our current effort and policies aimed at limiting the increase of temperature below uh, two degree, is it enough? Thank you very much, uh, Tommaso and Cecilia, for the introduction. Um, I've often been called a climate scientist, but I'm not. So I'm very much a ecologist, and I like biodiversity, and I like to study biodiversity. But as you said, it's very strongly related to climate change. Climate change is one of the drivers of the decline in biodiversity. But also, if you look at biodiversity decline, there are many others. If you just think, when I was born 60 years ago, we were only with 3 billion people. At the moment, 60 years later, we are with 7.5 billion people. But actually, it's only a 1.5% increase per year but those 7.5 billion people consume much more per person than the 3.5 or the 3 billion people when I was born. So it's also the consumption. Uh, the population has over doubled, but the consumption has increased tenfold. And the consumption means that we actually use a lot of resources. We use a lot of land. And if you think about biodiversity, biodiversity take sunlight, put it in through plants into carbon and all the sugars and all the starches and all the, the food we actually create. At the moment, we use, or we, that's humanity, humanity uses already almost half of all the plant material that is produced every year. So we have an enormous impact. And if you just think there is more domesticated animals, especially chicken, <laughs> than wild animals at the moment. And so our society with the domesticated animals, with agriculture, has actually moved into the areas of biodiversity very strongly and reduced the natural habitats of many, many species. And that's very much the decline in biodiversity. But at the same time, that, that change of the last 50 or 100 years, or maybe 2,000 years from the onset of agriculture, has created a society which is rich, richer, which is better fed, and has more resources than, than 50 years ago. Uh, from my youth, I still remember some very, very big famines, Biafra, etc., etc. At the moment, we have very few famines. Yes, people are poor. Sometimes people are on, on the fed, but it's a much smaller group <laughs> of the total population than, than 50 years ago. So we have made an enormous progress, human-wise, 
but at the expense of biodiversity, at the expense of climate change. And we see the atmosphere as a very big waste dump or sink for CO2 and other gases. And that's creating the climate change uh, problem. So there's very much the part. Now, if you look politically to climate change and biodiversity, and maybe I could get my, my slides there, the, the yeah. second slide especially. And there's the Climate Convention that was established in 1992. And the objective of the Climate Convention is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. So that should not be an increase, it should be stabilized. And that stabilization should be at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate. So no natural interference, just the human factor should be uh, non-dangerous. And I spent about five, six years of my career on explaining that we're dangerous. What is dangerous? What for me is dangerous is probably exciting for Cecilia. Uh, I will never jump with a parachute from an airplane, but I will cross the uh, Atlantic Ocean in a small sailing boat. That's not dangerous if you prepare well and if your equipment is, 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 is right, etc. So dangerous is not a scientific term, it's very much a political term, a personal choice uh, term. But the objective of the Climate Convention the UN Triple C is very much focusing on the, the dangerous is when ecosystems, there you have your biodiversity in the climate convention, ecosystems should be allowed to adapt naturally to climate change. Now, what is that? How fast should the climate change go to actually allow for that? Food production should not be threatened as to actually support the growing, more rich population. And the economic development should proceed in a sustainable manner. So that's very much the objective of the Climate Convention. At the same time, at this big conference in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, there's the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which actually tries to do a very similar thing for biodiversity, but it's not so visible as the Climate Convention. The Climate Convention really looks at countries, companies, and really deals with every aspect of our life, while biodiversity is much more local. And cumulative, it becomes a global problem. But here is much more local. You see the next slide? And if you actually look at 2015, when it was the big Paris Climate Summit, there was some success. Eh? The leaders the political leaders really made a selection. Dangerous climate change is the climate change larger than two degrees. So, or and some of the countries, especially the low-laying island states, said, yes, but two degrees is too much. Sea level rise will threaten us to be one and a half degrees. So, that two degree number that comes actually from science. So a lot of the people listen to that. Next slide, please. And so if you look at some of the science and there are the scenarios of the IPCC, there are the scenarios, what's, what you see in the line with the little red line is actually the observed temperatures. Then there's the dotted line 1990 and the observation of course, go on for another 10, 15 years. And then there are the scenarios and these scenarios depict different worldviews. If everybody is driving a big car, an SUV, you're on the top of the, the gray area. If you go down and go to a, a medium car, you're on the yellow line. If you go to a Toyota Prius, you're on the red line. And if you travel like most of our students in Wageningen, you're on the green line because you use a bicycle. There are no emissions uh, there. So it's, that's the spread. It's very much different energy systems, uh, etc. And the other figure is very much the reason for concern figure. And this is one of my figures where we focus on what is dangerous. We actually made the traffic lights green, yellow, red. 
But then everybody saw green as being safe, which we didn't mean. We meant little risk. <laughs> so we actually re removed the green color and changes into white, meaning little risk. But you also see in this figure, there is actually no sharp boundaries. There's a gradual movement from white to yellow to orange to red. So scientifically, it's very difficult to actually indicate where these uh, danger levels lie. But the first one, next slide, the first column very much focuses on biodiversity. Biodiversity is very vulnerable for climate change. And there are some ecosystems in this world, like the tundra in the polar areas, or coral reefs in the tropical areas, which are extremely sensitive for higher temperatures. Coral reefs bleach, and then there is ocean acidification because the oceans absorb CO2 and become more, more acid, and that really reduces those calcareous uh, organisms. The tundra, getting warmer, permafrost melts, etc. Uh, and of course, the polar bear, its habitat is the ice, and the ice is very quickly uh, melting. And then there are several crops, like grapevines, which are sensitive. And one of the most sensitive crops is actually coffee. Not a robusta coffee, but very much the very nice Arabica coffee. They need a very specific air moisture, etc. So maybe in 50 years, getting a very nice Italian espresso coffee will be difficult. You have to go to Starbucks. Now, mm -hmm. I don't like the Rosta there. And so it's every ecosystem, every species has its own response to climate change. And if you look at the bar, we actually say we already see negative impacts on biodiversity at the moment in the world. We see coral reefs are bleaching. We see the decline in habitat of the polar bear, etc. And we see shifting tree lines, etc. So we really said at the moment, the bottom line, zero degrees warming, there is already a risk. And that risk increases and becomes dangerous, red, at about one and a half to two degrees. There's the link to the Paris Agreement. Left next slide. Yeah, I just wanted to say that maybe uh, the worries with about coffee will make people more receptive to these tragic changes. <laughs> maybe, but there are alternatives to coffee as well. <laughs> <laughs> and the second bar is very much on extreme events, droughts, flooding, heat waves, etc. We have seen some of those. Uh, for example, in the uh, right bottom corner, you see the heat wave of 2003 in, in Europe. The probability uh, was very, very low, but because of climate change, the probability increased. But if it, the climate would be normal, like in the 60s of the uh, last century, the probability that such heat wave would hit Europe would actually be much, much smaller than you winning the national lottery. At the moment, it's about a thousand times uh, bigger. And so, there we have a very similar vulnerability. Danger is really start with one and a half, two degrees. The third bar on the next slide is very much the regional impacts. And here you see in the bottom pictures, the emissions are created by developed countries. And the countries are scaled here according to their emissions. But the impacts come mostly in the developing countries whose economies are very much depending on climate-dependent sectors. And so there's a very strong regional uh, differences. And some regions actually have positive impacts. Uh, Putin didn't want to sign the Kyoto Protocol because climate change was positive for Siberia. Now then he learns that a lot of the permafrost would melt and that would be negative for all the oil uh, um, infrastructure, etc. So he signed it uh, finally, but initially he thought that would be positive. So there are positive and negative impacts, but generally the negative impacts dominate. And the last two bars on the next uh, slide are very much the tipping point. 
things which probably will not happen, but if they happen, they have very big consequences, like the melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is a sea level rise of over 10 meters, um, the ocean currents, which will put Europe into a roller coaster, making it colder uh, again suddenly, and the whole, the, uh, the th fourth bar, at the, the global uh, issues like sea level rise and the impacts on the economy. So this figure, we call it the reason for concern figure, it has got a nickname, it's the burning ember diagram. And that has been one of the scientific rationales by putting all that literature together of all the, the, the impacts, both simulated impacts as well observed impacts to actually motivate the climate uh, agreement of, uh, of Paris. And the figure was updated just before Paris. And if you look at the update on the next slide, you actually see that they added a, a color. They added the color purple, which means very high risk. So it's beyond dangerous. And again, in the first one, you see the ecosystems uh, it's very much there is where a lot of the impacts will happen. And beyond two degrees, ecosystems cannot adapt naturally. Uh, that's very much given in this uh, figure. And the others, you also see some of the purple, but you also see that the red has been coming down in this figure. So between 2000, when the original figure was made, and 2015, when this figure was made, we actually believe that the world is not as robust to climate change, but much more vulnerable to climate change than we knew 50 years earlier. And in the last report, the one and a half degree report, which was a response to the Paris uh, target, they used to figure again, but then actually, could I have the next slide, uh, Tommaso? And they actually added the age and a medium to age confidence limits. How strong do all the scientists agree? Is there consensus that this figure is actually right? So it's a measure of some of the uh, uncertainties uh, in there. And they added, next slide, very much the different sectors. So they made a bar for coral reefs. They made a bar for mangroves. You see coral reefs are much more vulnerable the mangroves. They looked at fisheries, they looked at the Arctic region, and you see all these different vulnerabilities. Uh, but the discussion in Paris very much showed we have to look at the most vulnerable societies, the most vulnerable ecosystems, and that's why the two degree target is so strong. Beyond two degree, it will be very difficult to actually adapt to, to climate change, or adaptation becomes extremely expensive and mitigation maybe get more benefits and is cheaper than than adaptation and so it's that balance which is in these uh, figures uh, there thank you very much for uh this overview that was uh very very relevant and so you talked about like so we had we basically have an answer so uh beyond two degree uh ecosystem cannot adapt naturally so uh i think this is a clear uh take home message let's say um so you also talked about the word dangerous and how hard was it to um, define dangerous and how danger is dangerous in a science uh, assessment is much more a political uh, word rather than a scientific because it cannot be scientific the word da the, the word danger dangerous so that's why uh, we we ask you uh, this relationship between science and policy especially because you work with the IPCC and uh, we know that the, in, at the, in the IPCC, there is a summary for policymakers that basically it's a uh, couple of pages of um, uh, resume of, of uh, the scientific assessment. Um, and so based, based on your um, really fascinating experience, uh, could you pick three characteristics of an effective dialogue between these two uh, 
uh, really uh, far apart um, actors, uh, which are poli politi policies, uh, pol <laughs> politics and uh, science. Um, that would make this dialogue more effective or more in generally, uh, what is the role of uh, scientific experts, expertise uh, in mainstreaming this message? There are many, many difficult questions and several papers and books have been written about it. So I'll try to summarize <laughs> some of those insights I got from my, my own uh, work. You have these science policy assessments and Initially, when the IPCC was established, UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, wanted to write an assessment of what do we know about climate change. This was in 1985. But the then director of, IPC, uh, of UNEP was a little bit political. And there were several times that we said, no, this should not be a political document. This should be a scientifically credible documents. So they should be peer reviewed, etc. And they established IPCC, also under the auspicious of the UN and the World Meteorological uh, Organization. But in principle, there's a board in the IPCC who oversees. It's the eye of IPCC is not international, but it's intergovernmental. So the governments ask IPCC a series of questions. And those questions then become the outline of the report. And scientists are asked to fill all the chapters of that outline. Mm -hmm. And in the end, there's again a summary, a technical summary written by the scientists and a summary for policymakers. And that's again approved word by word, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, the 10 pages takes over a week um, in the plenary meeting. So that the summary for policymakers is accepted by the scientists and accepted by the policymakers. So that's very important that you get that buy-in of policymakers, that they accept this kind of science. And sometimes there have been controversies of the history of uh, the IPCC, controversies like the uh, hockey stick uh, diagram and some of the science which was pushed much too hard and was not robust at that time. Turned out to be very robust five years uh, later in the next report and things like that. But that's very much the essence of the design policy assessment. It's credibility. Legitimacy, so you make it for somebody and they should actually accept uh, it. And that's also done by the Global Biodiversity Outlook. That's done with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And the credibility is extremely important. So I think those assessments is a good way of science policy assessments and of a, a dialogue. But an IPCC report is about 5,000 pages with thousand words on each page. No prime minister will read that. So they maybe will read the summary for policymakers, but those 50 pages are also. So you also have to have local information. I talk to policymakers in the Netherlands. I talk to international policymakers uh, as a uh, representative of the International Council of Science. I actually gave every year a lecture to the UNFCC on the latest insights in the science. I did that together with IPCC, and IPCC had to actually stick to its procedures. They could not tell anything which was not reviewed, and I could tell anything. Now, I can tell you some stories, but I won't. But <laughs> those dialogues are extremely important, and I can tell one. Uh, one of the pictures we once showed was the CO2 which was used to actually create a product. Okay. Now, a lot of our products are made in China, and China is at the moment a country with the highest emissions. But then we actually looked at it a little bit differently. Normally, you look where the emissions are emitted. That's the country which gets these emissions. But we actually say yes, but that's not fair. You actually have to allocate the emissions to the country where the products are used. 
that actually meant that Chinese emissions went down 40%, European emissions and American emissions went up <laughs> quite considerably. That's the only time in that lecture I was booed by the developed countries and hate by, by China. Uh, but that's very much a discussion. It's a global problem. Should we distribute emissions where they come from, by countries, by people, by generations, etc.? And you really want sometimes to kick that discussion and not sit within these yeah, straight jackets of country boundaries. Mm -hmm. So we also did quite a lot of projects where we had stakeholders. For example, we did a big science policy dialogue with our integrated assessment model image before the Kyoto Protocol. There we selected the negotiators from European countries and developing countries and the low-laying islands. We didn't invite the US because then the conflict between Europe and the US would be in the middle of the table and you won't get a dialogue. And we wanted the dialogue between the modeling, the modelers, the scientists and the uh, community. And at a certain point, they were very much interested in our models and all our scenarios. We were very happy. But at a certain point, Kyoto came closer. They said, no, no, no. But your models are always focusing on 2100, these long-term scenarios. Mm -hmm. And we said, yes. But if we focus on 2000 or 2010 or 2020, the scenarios are all very similar. It's in the beginning of, of all the, the trends. Yes, but they said, the Kyoto Protocol is actually setting the target for 2010. It was a discussion in 1997. <laughs> and then through that dialogue, one of the negotiators really came up with the idea, can't we make a tool that takes the long-term targets to 2100 and link them to the near-term activities. And that became a safe lending tool. We call it that way just because if you go down too fast, you crash your airplane before the runway. If you go down too slow, you crash beyond the runway. So you have to have a certain speed and a certain slope to land safe. And that gives a windows of opportunities in there. And that was never scientifically published. <laughs> that was immediately taken by those negoti negotiators to the negotiations in Kyoto. And yeah, we were made famous overnight with that new tool, but it came from the negotiators. We would never have thought about it as scientists. So there are a lot of those kinds of dialogues we actually talk to together. And I think what's very important in those dialogues, if it's a science policy dialogue, in the assessment or in, in, in research, you actually, as a scientist, have to adopt to the needs of your stakeholders and to their issues. And you have to be aware that those issues change over time as well. So if the prime minister gives me a lot of research money to appoint several PhD students for four years, of course, I'm very happy and they will do great research, but if I address one of his questions now and give the answers four years ago, he will say, sorry, that's my question four years ago. I have moved on. <laughs> and so you have to have that continuous dialogue with policymakers to actually make a difference. And that's on all levels, that's nationally, that's internationally, but also in a local municipal or with NGOs, etc., etc. Uh, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, that definitely does. And and building on what you just said, I, I like to uh, bring in some que a question from the public because we were talking about the dimension of of the issue, which is uh, local, national, and then international. But at the international level, the entire regime for biodiversity, uh, the environmental regime, uh, is highly fragmented. So one of the questions that we have is uh, instead of continuing in working in these silos, is there a need for a single MEA that will include everything or there is a need for more cooperation? 
Now, in my talks to the UNFCCC, I've often pointed that you have to do more with biodiversity. But there are silos, unfortunately, in the different uh, departments, in the different governments, in the different UN uh, conventions. And it's very, very difficult to move one responsibility to the other or let them collaborate, also because they have different uh, agendas. Um, I think climate, because it's a very similar problem using the fossil fuels, has to be reduced at the international level. It's a relatively simple and straightforward problem. Biodiversity links to how we use the natural resources. It's a local problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but because we use them everywhere in the world, it becomes a global problem. But how to actually deal with it and deal with the needs of, of, of the people, you have to look locally. And, and cumulative, you can actually solve it. But it's much more difficult. And you don't get that strong visibility. There is also another um, comment, uh, and it's really related to exactly what you said right now, that uh, climate change and biodiversity are, as you said, intertwined in nature, but not, not in international environmental law. And so uh, Chiara asked if we need to, if we need an agreement that integrates the two issues together, or there is another way forward. Now, I think, um, I don't think we need an agreement to integrate them very specifically in one of those UN conventions. They have been dealt with uh, separately, but such an agreement already exists. It's the Sustainable Development Goals. And one of the Sustainable Development Goals focus on climate, one of the Sustainable Development on marine uh, ecosystem and biodiversity, on terrestrial ecosystem and biodiversity, on food security. So biodiversity and climate change are intertwined in several of the Sustainable Development Goals. And you, to achieve all the Sustainable Development Goals, you actually have to take an integrated approach. You cannot start, okay, we have 17 of those goals, we start with number one, if that's achieved, we continue with number two. No, <laughs> they are strongly dependent from each other. So there, I think you have to make the integrations. And then the integration is not only at the governmental level, it's also with companies, it's with people, with NGOs, with local governments, with city mayors who actually are much more active now in dealing with climate change and making their uh, city climate neutral and climate uh, resilient, etc. So I think there is where the action should uh, should be, rather than creating another integrated uh, convention with a lot of different acronyms, which I don't like. But we have already plenty of them. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I see that the, the people are just uh, trying to, to also um, ask some more questions about the, the topic. Um, so we uh, are at the end of our uh, first two questions. We have the, our last one that is mostly uh, related to our current situation. So um, we were really, um, at least we at the last in the last year we saw um, this excitement and this um, involvement of especially young people, uh, especially in the climate change uh, protest uh, with Greater Thunberg, with a lot of actors uh, involved, and um, it was also supposed to be the 2020 uh, the super year for nature. Uh, but of course, with this COVID uh, situation, with this uh, pandemic, uh, everything seemed to has uh, the, the, everything seemed stopped, and therefore um, we 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 were intrigued by this relationship between uh, nature and uh, humanity, or like human in general, and how um, how do you think this global pandemic uh, has affected our understanding of um, human and nature, and there, therefore the relationship between the two, if uh, can if if we are we are gonna expect a change uh, in this perception or uh, maybe a worsening of the I don't know it's just we were thinking about um, especially 
in relationship with the pandemic? Now, I think the COVID pandemic is actually a quite benign pandemic. Yes, a lot of people died. There has been, because of all the measures, an enormous impact on the economy. Mm. But if you look at the emissions of CO2, for example, only globally were reduced by 17%. Now, that's not leveling the atmospheric concentrations. The atmospheric mm. concentration, even with this reduction, are still increasing. We need about five or six of these pandemics at the same time, time 17, to reduce the emissions to, to uh, zero. That's very much the challenge ahead of us. If you look at the causes of the decline in biodiversity, I strongly believe that those causes also contributed to the pandemic. We are reducing habitats. And we are increasing the contact with wildlife and their viruses and people. So this pandemic will emerge more often. And there's one uh, researcher, E.O. Wilson, who actually also coined the term biodiversity uh, 30 years ago, who actually said, we have to set aside half of this planet for nature and half the other half to people. At that time, we don't have so much contact with nature anymore and pandemics would be uh, reduced or the risk of pandemics would be reduced. But I think the pandemics like we had SARS, now COVID, um, Ebola, is very much because there is so little habitat left and we use so much of the natural resources by uh, eating wildlife, etc. that it has to happen uh, one, one time. And so it's not completely unexpected and it's part of the whole environmental trend. And it's not just a natural disaster or a, this pandemic. So there are parallel issues in there. And if we really have to deal with them, now health is one of the SDGs again, we have to actually do that better integration and try to live sustainably. And so people say, yes, but the carrying capacity of this planet is only three and a half billion people. Now I'm too old to get children. I have had my two uh, nice children, but maybe your generation should say no to children mm. and start to reduce the world's human population on a natural way. Now, I think that's extremely difficult because getting children is a gift. It's very inspiring. Now, the other side, which I started my, my talk, is actually our abundant consumption. And the number of people doubled in the last 50 years, our consumptions increased tenfold. So we have to reduce consumptions. We shouldn't buy more and more clothes, travel more, etc., use more fossil fuels, etc. We should start giving these kind of lectures to each other. We should start playing music to each other, reading poems, etc., etc., and make an economy not on resource use, but on emotions and non-resource uh, assets, etc. It may be difficult, but we have to actually change into that sustainability direction. Yeah, and one of the, the, the things that came out of the pandemic is, well, it has been already created as a concept, the concept of one health, one health which takes into consideration the environmental health, human health, and also other social, uh, social factors. Because I think if there's one key takeaway from this talk is that we can't deal with one thing without uh, considering all the externalities of it. So um, I've been following the Convention on Biological Diversity. They're developing the new plan for the next 10 years. And at the beginning of the discussion, this health uh, component was not there. Right now, uh, the co-chairs who are in charge of leading this process actually made a strong statement regarding including it. Uh, we know that the COP26 on climate change has been moved to next year, November, 
which is quite surprising because they postponed it for an entire year. Uh, and since the majority of our public is Italian, Italy is one of their co-hosts, if you, in case you didn't know. <laughs> but do you think that this one health approach could be applied also in that convention? And that would be the bridging theme. Probably, yes. It's, it is a new idea. So I think what I see both in the climate convention and in the biodiversity convention is very much technological fixes. And with technological fixes, you can deal a little bit, but you cannot deal with the problem. Uh, so um, it helps and it gives some hope, but it doesn't solve the problem. We really have to start thinking about our society, our economy, our resource use in, in different ways. And that could be circular, that could be uh, green. And there are a lot of discussions going on uh, in academic uh, literature, but also within uh, NGOs, etc. But if you say we need change, it's very difficult to envision an ideal world where biodiversity prospers, where people prosper, etc. But there's no racism. Uh, I see some contours, but I don't know how to fill it in. And then the big discussion is, is how to get there. Yeah, that, that for sure. And the scenario right now is not one of the the brightest, let's say, seeing everything that's been going on in the past few months. But hopefully there's the, this new, this is a breaking point and it leads to something positive. Um, we have one question actually through WhatsApp. We, one of uh, the people watching us uh, looking at the, the figures and the scenario that has been painted, which it's, it's sad but true. Uh, ask, is there a way that we can go back and actually improve the system or should we just focus on saving what's saveable? Hmm. Now, I've chaired one of the working groups of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and that assessment uh, mainstreamed the concept of ecosystem services. And I think 10% of the land mass of this planet and about 3% of the oceans are protected. So those are one way or the other, it's not ideal, but they are safe. And that's very much done because of their intrinsic value of the species in those protected areas and the habitats in those protected areas. But that actually means that 90% of the land is not protected or can be used. And when we looked at the ecosystem services concept, we very much looked at those areas. Mm -hmm. Land provides multiple services, multiple products. You can have food, you can have fiber, you can have shelter, you can have beauty <laughs> for tourism, the landscapes, etc., especially Italian landscapes. And so there are multiple uh, ecosystem services uh, in there and multiple uses. But generally, we only value with money the production functions and not all the other functions. So we are thinking, and maybe it's a little bit naive, to actually, if we can put value to all the other functions as well, people will start managing them. That we carbon co sequestration, could be slope stability, et cetera, et cetera. So that's very much in that discussion, but it is also a technical fix. So now with the corona, what you see there is actually that an enormous amount of money is spelled spent to keep jobs. But a lot of those jobs are an industry you actually don't want to have. The fossil fuel industry, the airplane, uh, the carrier industry, etc., etc. So if you use that money, if governments use that money to keep employment, to keep those big businesses going, they should actually set very strict rules on how to use them so that these companies also start making the transition to carbon neutral, to deal with biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, that's not done. And therefore, we wrote an opinion paper uh, a few weeks ago in, in The Guardian, and really that started a discussion on how to actually 
make the transition and where to that transition should uh, should go. And that discussion is ongoing and we haven't solved it, but there's an interesting number of people involved, so both scientists and activists, but especially social scientists like psychologists and communication scientists who really have interesting ideas how to frame the needed net narratives. Yeah, and the needed on the technologies. Economics, on the economics of biodiversity, um, I don't know how many people know this, but I, towards November, the Das Gupta review should come out, which is trying to have a comprehensive, giving uh, economic, um, ter in a, describing biodiversity in economic terms. So that could be a tool uh, that governments can use. Uh, that's, again, a technological fix and not uh, one of the fixes that you were advocating for, but it's still one way to convince, let's say, um, a certain segment of the population that, that this transition is needed. Like We need to shift to avoid the deep purple scenarios everywhere. Yep. But that's very much what we also do in our research in my group in Wageningen. We call mm -hmm. it ecosystem uh, accounting, and Lars Hein is, is leading that. And that's actually making progress, and it really puts a, a number on biodiversity and natural resources, which can be used in the national economic accounts mm -hmm. uh, to compare if actually the natural capital in a country goes up or goes down. Yeah. Uh, Chichi? Yeah, uh, no, I just had um, yeah a reflection, let's say, because you, you said that um, especially with after this uh, pandemic, there are many people with many ideas about the kind of uh, rebuilding our economy and all these really um, interesting and, and way forward. Um, but uh, do you really think that there is a chance uh, for... A, a new a, a new green wave let's say because i i don't know i i don't know if it's a common feeling um of of um especially politicians to uh build back our economy in a more sustainable way and in a greener way i think um i don't want to say it but it's i feel that it's a little bit naive because i also uh feel that uh, now economies just want to um, reshape our, our, our themselves in, a, in, a, in, a, in the best way possible and in the quickest way possible. And I think the, uh, the, they will only be rebuilt in, uh, with, the same, with the same structure that they had before. And so I don't know if this, um, this new development will be in the in the in in, in the sustainable way. Uh, I don't know. I feel a little bit negative about this, and I just wanted to uh, know your opinion about it because we also have to be realistic, I guess. Yeah, but what's realistic? Is realistic optimistic <laughs> make a transition, or is realistic conservative and not making a change? So realistic, I find a very, very difficult word. Maybe even so more difficult. Than <laughs> um, but in, in principle, if you look at many European countries or many countries of the world, they actually go a conservative path. They think some of the com companies are too big to fail, so we have to help them. A lot of the money spent is actually not going to the companies, but going through the companies to people, uh, to employ the people and to get uh, job uh, security. Uh, you can question that as well. Should all the companies be saved or, or not? Or all the jobs be saved or, or not? Uh, but I see a development at the moment at the European level within the EU. They have really set the Green Deal. And there's big discussion by the EU commissioners and the EU EU Commission that the Green Deal should actually get more money to make that transition and to deal with mm -hmm. the uh, Corona crisis. So there are, on a high level, <laughs> pushes in the right directions. But at a lower level, there are a lot of pushes in the wrong uh, directions. So I don't know where 
what the outcome will be. And I definitely hope there won't be a delay in climate policy, there won't be a delay in biodiversity policy, because dealing with those issues is extremely urgent. We have delayed yeah. them already 25 years. Yeah, I mean... Do you, are you, are you positive ahead. about um, this change in within five years? I don't know, like, ask, since me, you... ask me in five years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a great answer. Um, are there are other questions? Uh, no, from from the audience, not. And um, as we said to to our to our people who to the people who are watching us, that we try to keep these talks between an hour, so we're towards the end. Um, but we did this with our previous guests. We will do it with the next guests that will come. So I will ask you a quick fire question. Let's say. What is the one thing that the people watching us can do after our talk? Something they can read, something they can watch, or a concrete, more concrete action that they can take to help us uh, in going in the right direction, let's say. I know it, it's a very on the spot question, but. Oh, it's very easy. You're almost uh, ready for dinner, at least here in this uh, time zone. It's almost dinner time. Don't eat red meat. Become a vegetarian. And go to the shop, not by car, but by feet or by the bicycle. And put a sweater on instead of heating your home. And put a window open instead of cooling your home. <laughs> so become less dependent on fossil fuels and fertilizer, etc. And all that red meat influences uh, land use enormously and is fed with our best grains and soya. So that's not the way to go. If we all become. Yeah, so I think one. If we all become vegetarians, deforestation will stop immediately. So I think one take home message from this talk that you also mentioned in the second uh, answer is that change uh, is is in our hands basically and and uh, big ch changes can also uh, come from very uh, small action i know that this sentence might everybody heard about this sentence sentence but i think we should focus on the um, we we should emphasize it because it's it's basically um, what what can be relevant for the future. So I think that that's a very um, I don't know important um, statement. And also, as you said, now is dinner time, so you can you can start doing your um, your active. Uh, Changed by these choices, and I also believe in the power of us consumers. As um, uh, as really, as we have a really important power, uh, and also our I, I really believe that our eating choices are also political choices. So, um, yeah, definitely, I I must agree <laughs> with you. I don't know if uh, for me if yes, you have. You can also make a difference. Think about Greta Thunberg, who really started the school strikes uh, and actually affected an enormous amount of people and created, maybe it was not her plan, but she created a movement. Yeah. And she has a very clear message. Listen to science. Listen to evidence. Yeah, which seems like something you shouldn't be, Is it you shouldn't be saying. Uh, restating at least, uh, we we listened to science during the pandemic. We all stayed home. We try. Uh, we we put on mask and we did the social distancing. So that's a clear example that when people listen to science, it leads to positive or less negative outcomes. So I think if we listen to science, also in this case, we can translate the positive uh, global, let's say, action that we took during these months also in this other scenario, which. Personally, I feel like it will be much bigger. And as you said, pandemics will come more and more because we're being disrupting habitats. So 
yeah so if you're if you're now going to dinner or aperitivo or whatever you're going right now uh think about this and think about the carbon price of your of your choices let's put it that way um yeah and with this we are literally one hour in so i would like to thank you uh, it's weird from us italian this on time yeah being on time like this is not that usual for us but <laughs> we were uh, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to thank you for your participation. Uh, we'll be sharing the article, the, the opinion piece that you posted in The Guardian in the Facebook event so people can have a read. And also you will find this uh, video on our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel. So you'll find it everywhere. So very, very glad we could have this talk and thank you for taking some time uh, to watch us. And thank you, Rick, for explaining this, this developments and the, the urgency of these changes. Yeah. Thank you for hosting me. You're welcome. Then okay. I guess. Yeah, I guess um, we can close. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again. And uh, see you everybody next week. Okay. Have a nice weekend. Bye. <laughs>